Revelation 6 to chapter 8, verse 1. The Suffering of the Saints, Scene 2 by Paul Bucknell. This is part of a larger expository series on the book of Revelation, Vision to Strengthen the Saints. Produced by Biblical Foundations for Freedom, www.foundationsforfreedom.net. Releasing God's truth to a new generation. We're going through the book of Revelation, Vision to Strengthen the Saints. And today we're continuing on with scene two, but the second part. You'll see that we have the text we'll be looking at today for you on, on both sides. That is for the exercise that we'll be doing in just a moment. We will pass out a handout, official handout, in a moment, uh, but that will uh, be coming. And so just use that sheet that you have, that chart, to take notes as you would wish. It, I think there's a whole blank back. We'll be talking about one uh, special topic before we even do that chart. Last week, uh, you remember, uh, we talked about chapters 4 and 5, and I thought it was the most grand thing that uh, just a couple days earlier, we had a, one whole evening, we could just worship God in song. And I said, we didn't plan that, but it really worked out beautiful with Revelation 4 and 5, because that was the saints that were singing before God. It's the picture of our celebration and our adoration of God's greatness. Not just because we have to, but from our hearts, God has done such a great work uh, in causing that sense of appreciation and devotion and commitment. It just changes us toward him. Sometimes we have authority figures, we respect them. But God wants it to go beyond that, not just respect, but a, a sense of friendship, a friendship of, uh, sense of love, sense of uh, joy in our hearts. And we see that. We do see that. Uh, of course, we see much more in the book of Revelation, and it gives us many questions. I personally have been challenged to this book. I mean, when I first became a Christian back in the 70s, uh, there was a movement going on for several years that talked about the return of Christ and whether it was happening soon. And uh, early on, it was Hal Lindsey, and the book came out, actually, The Late Great Planet Earth. I remember one of my speech classes at the University of Maine, I I gave a, a talk on that, <laughs> the late great planet Earth. So uh, I'm very uh, interested in all of this. I've studied it from different perspectives. I went to a school that uh, actually holds to a very different perspective than I hold now. Uh, but also I uh, was raised with a mentor who uh, taught very similar to what I do uh, believe now. Well, we'll be talking about different beliefs. And actually, we, we welcome your different opinions and thoughts. Uh, we're not trying to cr criticize them by any means. Uh, but we're just trying to help you kind of clear up some things. Because many people are speaking, and, uh, you, but a lot of people are not thinking and studying the book of Revelation. And that's our job, our duty right now. And not only to study it in such a way that we are fully impacted by its message. Now I have one of the most difficult topics here. Because <clears throat> ideally we all should be up in heaven as we look at these verses, right? Because this is where John is. And we'll look at that in a moment. And, it, and it's really kind of shocking. But, you know, when he's seeing this, he is, this is a live scene. This is not just, you know, something that's been recorded in the past. Or something. It's a live scene. And so for us to really engage, we have to understand chapters 4 and 5 and be in that thrill, that sense of humbling adoration of seeing God on the throne as we begin and continue on in chapters 6 and 7. Let's pray as we continue. Lord, we thank you so much for this book of Revelation. We have so much to learn. Uh, we're humbled, Lord, that you would even share these secrets of what's coming upon us, Lord, what is with us so that we could understand and have your perspective as we live out our lives. Now, Lord, make your church strong. Help and bless us, we pray. In Christ we ask. Amen. So we're talking about scene two, the sufferings of the church. Now this is, as we're going to go through uh, most every week, we're going to just quickly review, introduce in a sort of way, the eight scenes of Revelation. The whole book of Revelation is repeated like waves in the ocean, seven of them at one time. Like when I go swimming in the ocean, I'll notice there's a bunch of big waves that come, then it stops for a while. Then another series of big waves, and then it stops and quiets down for a while. So I'm just kind of waiting there for the big waves so I can surf, body surf them. But, you know... Uh, this is like that. So we have seven, a pause, you know, seven, pause. And some at the end, though, it's like a storm is there and the waves don't stop. It's just seven upon seven upon seven. And you just right into the end, 
end of ends and or the beginning of eternity. Uh, you can't say eternity, beginning of eternity as we would see it. Anyways, uh, the uh, first seven was what? Seven what did he describe? First, first row is what? Seven churches. churches, seven churches, yeah. And so we were looking at the church in the world. We're going to actually quickly comment on that in a moment. And uh, last week we started talking scene two, which he didn't actually get into. That's what we're going to talk about today in chapter six uh, to eight is this uh, seal, seven seals. And think of a seal as you have a scroll. In the old days, they didn't have books like we have a library back there. They had scrolls, special scrolls, and uh, the more important, they, they would seal them with some wax. Excuse me. Uh, wax, seven seals. Think of it, okay? And I want you to think of the seals as when you take one off, it start, you can start seeing what's there. Or take another one off, you can see more, more, more. It's when you take the seventh one off it, that it actually fully opens. And that's the picture we have before us as we think about the seven seals. Uh, we'll be talking about them. Now, these are not the seals that, you know, you know, these are the seals on a scroll. So think of it that way. These are the future classes as we go along. Uh, what characterizes the Great Tribulation? What does God reveal about the 144,000? Or why is there so much killing of believers through the centuries right now to the present? I, I am totally humbled by um, the scenes that we see nowadays. Uh, and you don't have to go read about what's happening in another part of the world. It's what's happening in our country. Absolute uh, attacks upon Christians. I mean, the one, recent one in Oregon, you know, stand up. Are you a Christian? <laughs> Boom, right to your head. Uh, if not, that he just shot you in the leg. You know, so pretty, pretty uh, powerful, isn't it? And uh, who knows what happened to your class or to our church service or wherever you are. Anything can happen anywhere. And so it's kind of startling us to waken us up to, wow, you know, this is not far off here. This can happen anywhere to anyone, including me. And uh, so th those questions are really pertinent as we discuss them. And why would those people say I'm a Christian and then be shot? Why is it that they would? And so some of these are the deeper questions behind the book of Revelation. Why there's a church at all? I mean, what is the church? Is it just meeting together? Uh, well, we do, but there's something that God's done in us by freeing us from our sins through the blood of Christ, which was talked so much about the Lamb, and we'll talk about a little bit today. Okay, so I want to ask this question, because as we go on to this, oh, let me just introduce a little more connection here. Chapters 4 and 5 begin the second seal, and you'll see it here. Uh, and what happens at the beginning of each of these scenes, uh, sub, there's seven scenes, right? Uh, as we see in 4.1, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me. Now, a sound of a trumpet, someone speaking. You know, it's a very loud, booming sound. It, okay, what do you want? Come up here, I'll show you what must take place after these things. And so... You know, there's that whole sense of he's escalated up into heaven and he's seeing what's going to happen. Very, very uh, powerful, powerful. Do you remember uh, some of the scenes there in chapter 4 and 5? The worship scenes, God on the throne. Who else was there? Anybody remember? The four creatures. Four creatures. What else? 24 elders. 24 elders. Good. And remember what was in his hand, right? And everyone started, everyone started weeping. Oh, no. No one can open up the scroll. Here's God holding a scroll. Everyone's crying. Oh, you know what's happening? You know, John said, the angel said to John, don't worry about it. God, you know, the lamb can open it. Now, that's what we're going to be looking. When we're saying he's opening the seals, it will be in Jesus' hand, and he is taking the seal off one by one further revealing our understanding of what's to happen later. And this stands, the seal, of course, stands for God's great redemptive plan, how he's saving a people out of the world to be his forever and ever, how he's going to complete and solve the problem of evil. The big problem is evil is, 
well, why does it happen is one question, but the other one is, how do you balance the records? I mean, how do you straighten all that out? And he does through judgment. And so there's great praise. So this is a continuation. So actually, this second scene starts in 4.1, goes right to 8.1, four chapters, and that's why we split it. Um, so, but we're looking at 6 to 7 today. And uh, here's the first verse of chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the lamb broke one of the seals. Now, you get the question? Get the key here. This is one of the keys. You're going to have a chart, right? And in a moment, we're going to be filling that chart in. This is the first seal. One of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, come. Now, if someone said that to you, would you do it? <laughs> a four living creature, you know, it's like, you know, it's a magnificent, powerful, you know, awesome, beyond description type of creature. And he says, come. You know, it's, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> it can be kind of really uh, overwhelming, overwhelming. But anyways, the lamb broke these seals and unveiled the view of God's plan and operation. He is the director. He's the one that can open it, which reflects that he has the authority to carry it out. And that is what's so important and important for us to understand. Any questions quite on this? This is just still introductory. Yes? I just got a little bit confused between scenes and seals. That will be the second scene. Yes. Between the scenes and seals. That will be the second whole drama. If I call each one a drama, it might. But there's seven, uh, eight dramas, okay? Each one consists of seven scenes. And in this case, the seven scenes are not just scenes, they're, they're called seals. That's what distinguishes each one. And you can see it because, uh, like in verse 1 here, it's, it's like, come. What are you going to see? It, the draw is, it's actually, when you look carefully at the verse, you're going to see, he saw this. He went there and he heard this. So it's like taking him into a whole different room. Okay, what do you see? That's going to be the key for each of these okay. and trying to understand that. But overall, and, and yes, it can be confusing because the same kind of numbers and all that. We're going to be just looking at that second row and the original eight scenes of Revelation. We're just talking about the second. Okay, I'm going to kind of step into a, a question. Uh, is there going to be a pre-tribulation rapture? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> Some people believe that. Okay. And, uh, and that's, that's fine. Now, I, what I want to discover, uh, discuss here... It's not so much whether there'll be a rapture, but whether the book of Revelation talks about the rapture. Okay, That's my, my focus here. Now, there's uh, about four or five reasons they say the pre-tribulation rapture is talked about in Revelation. Um, I have great suspect that it doesn't at all. Not, not, not like, anyways, not a pre-tribulation rapture that they're talking about. Now, let me go back to the word rapture. It talks about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In a twinkling of the eye, the believers will be caught up with the Lord, and they will be with him forever. That's where the whole sense of rapture, and most believers believe that. You know, yep, when Jesus comes back, we'll be caught up. Now, the argument of, of, of discussion point here is when it will happen and in what conditions it will happen. Now, when we say pre-tribulation rapture, that's a little bit different. They're framing, and what they're saying is that actually this rapture, the catching of the church, will happen before the tribulation period. Okay, That's why it's called pre, before the tribulation. So they don't believe the church, as we know it now, would go through the tribulation period. And they base it uh, where it happens in the book of Revelation, and I'm going to pick out three of the main uh, reasons why they reason this way. Now, these are from verses we already discussed in chapter 3 and 4. And chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Because you kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And their point is quite simple. Look at God promises to keep us from the hour of testing. Okay? Uh, so, invitation, chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I just read this verse. I looked, and behold, a door standing in heaven, the first voice which I heard, like the voice of a trumpet. He said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place. Their understanding, this invitation, is to the church. That is the rapture. Come. And that happens. That's how they put it in here. Uh, another point is verse four, chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, the identification of the 24 elders. And, a, and I know we have a trouble 
identifying the 24 elders. And around the throne, there were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, uh, thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. They said, these can't be angels. They have to be the church. And so they understand that by this time, the church is already raptured and is in heaven with the Lord. Okay. So upon these reasonings, they say, this is when, chapter 3 and 4, is when the rapture takes place. And that's why it takes, and the reason I say this is because once we get to chapter 4 and 5, excuse me, uh, when we get to chapter 6, verse 1, that's when the tribulation starts. So they have to say the church is taken out before the tribulation starts. Now, I want to give three counterpoints, okay? First, the insinuation uh, on the counter arguments that he uses the church at Philadelphia that they would had a promise that God would keep them from the tribulation. For, for me, I, I see this is discussing one part of the church that has been faithful, that has suffered greatly, uh, describing the church at Philadelphia, not describing all the churches, which you would think would happen if, and a promise to all the churches, if this was true. So, but instead, uh, I, I think... What it's talking about, it was a promise for those saints who were actually suffering at the Church of Philadelphia that God at certain points will see what you suffered on earth and will not ask you to go further. He'll just put you in a place, in a city or a town, where you will not be going through that tribulation. To me, this is the way I understand it. Not as a call that God has promised all Christians that he's going to keep them from tribulation. In fact, we're going to look at different scriptures that says different on that. So uh, another point uh, in the second one, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, they say that the invitation to John to come to heaven was an invitation to the church to come to heaven as a rapture. Uh, but this looks very personal. All throughout the book of Revelation, uh, he's talking to John particular. And in fact, chapter 1 talks about John. I, John, you know, on Patmos and all this on the Lord's Day. Uh, so it's, it's very odd. All of a sudden, they would jump from using an I was called uh, to come up to the church to come up. Very, very odd uh, way of working that through. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't think that refers to the rapture at all. And, and thirdly, uh, on the identification of 24 elders, well, let me just call that a moot question. We don't base our teaching on something that's unclear. It's very hard to understand for really, we tried, we tried to declare, you know, the elders stand for the church as a whole. Uh, but not, what they say is though that it stands only for the raptured church before the time of the tribulation, okay? But we're saying it actually represents the church as a whole with the 24 elders, 12 apostles, 12 uh, tribes in the Old Testament, that understanding of all Christian Jews, uh, all the cr uh, true faithful ones throughout time, and that would be there. So let me just use a, a graph here to kind of um, highlight this difficulty. And th again, the reason I'm talking about this is in a minute where I'll use these same charts here for the 144,000, for the trouble, the suffering saints. This is all very significant to the whole understanding of Revelation. And if you carry this understanding, you will twist book of Revelation around, I believe, to put uh, and miss the message of the book of Revelation. That is one of my greatest fears. We've had a whole series, the Left Behind series. Anybody see that? A whole back there. I, I really fear that a lot of the Americans in church in, the, in, the, in America will be totally scared and unprepared for what's coming. Now, the, the question is this. So if God is keeping us from a tribulation, that's great. No one will have a problem here. Um, including me, uh, I certainly don't have a problem being raptured before the tribulation. Uh, <laughs> one of my prayers has always been, keep me out of trouble. Um, but notice, you know, that's, that happens. But on earth, it's you're going to actually stay there through time and go through the tribulation. Okay, that, that's the understanding. And that, so on the raptured, on the top part, to keep us from the tribulation, on the bottom, it's keep us during the tribulation. Okay, so which is actually true and talking about it through the scriptures, and particularly we're talking about the book of Revelation. So uh, in the pre-trib rapture perspective, Revelation 3, 4, that's up to the rapture, and then after that, it's after. It's tribulation onward, that's for a whole different group of believers that will have to be saved 
and everything like that. So that's how they kind of per perceive all this. Uh, for us, the tribulation is going on. <coughs> and uh, crises are helping, happening all around us. I mean, I, I was, my, my good friend was, uh, yeah, it was just kind of like me, had a similar burden in Orissa and, you know, the, a lot of radical Hindus go through and kill Christians, maim them, destroy all their businesses. Very, very difficult. Um, you, you can see the persecution. Okay? You can feel it. You can see it. Uh, they were in tents, all the believers, for about four years. They couldn't go back home or under the threat of being killed. Uh, my friend was poisoned. Uh, you know, it, it, it's things like that are very, very difficult. But, you know, the tribulations here... And, and because we're in America, we've been protected, we don't think about suffering in a very concrete way. Actually, this whole pre-trib revelation, uh, pre-trib um, rapture understanding did not come about to the 1800s. It was never before that in the historical church. It's a very new understanding. Maybe we'll talk more about that another time. There, there's different viewpoints even on that. So even there's some people believe in a post-tribulation rapture or mid-tribulation rapture. Okay? So... Uh, and some believe that the rapture actually describes Jesus when he comes back and the judgment scene. Okay, So, so there's several different scenarios and understanding. Uh, but in terms of tribulation, some believe, yes, the, tribula the uh, tribulation has started since Christ's time you know, onward. Some believe it's going to be uh, accelerated toward the very end where everything becomes clear together. We call it the great tribulation. So there's a lot of uh, loose... Um, factors out there that are very significant. You mentioned the word antichrist, but John says on one hand, First John, there are many antichrists already. You know, but we're thinking always of one antichrist, and, and so okay, why are we okay? That's the book of Revelation. So, so it, it's it's hard to put it all together. So as we go on, we'll try to describe and fill in. I'll take a little time or with other teachers to kind of give a little input. You know, this is why this is not this. But our, our task actually today is to look at the tribulation. Um, so I, you got your charts, take them out, and on the first line you'll see uh, we're going to be looking for seals. I already showed you how to look for them. We're going to take this sheet with all the scriptures, and we're quickly going to read, scan it. And you can read it if you can, if you can read quick. You're going to scan it, and you're just going through down, and you can circle right on this sheet. It'll be yours. You, you have pens over here as you need them. And you're going to just circle one, two, three, four, where he opens a seal. Usually it says he opened a seal, okay? Uh, and he opened one of the seven seals. Uh, and so you can go down there and just fill in the chart as you will, okay? Uh, the next thing you're going to do, and that's probably all we have time for, what did he see? Okay, so mark down one or two things he saw. In chapter, in verse 2 it says, chapter 1 he got a call come. Chap verse 2 of chapter 6, I'm looking on the sheet here. It says, and I looked, notice the word looked, or I saw, or I heard, right? And what did he see? It's a whole new room he's in all of a sudden. And he sees what? A white horse. Okay, so write down the white horse, okay? So that's how we're going to do that. Um, and so what I want you to do is just the first two columns, and uh, we can uh, work through that. Now, can we just break into, like, uh, groups right where you are? Um, you don't have to move all around. It's not like the traditional groups. Could we just uh, maybe three or four, wherever you are, and just uh, kind of do that together, make sure you're all connected? I'll, I won't give you too much time. Or maybe seven minutes, okay? <laughs> okay, so just break into groups and just talk about it. Hey, I found verse, and, and when you say, I found the third seal in chapter six verse, whatever, and you all write it down. What did he see? Okay, so you can just kind of Write it down as you're talking, as you discover things together. Don't look at the verb to seal. That is also used. We're looking at the opened a seal. Just focus on the first two columns. I know he saw a lot of things in some scenes, but don't just write down a couple. Don't worry about everything. Come around. We'll have attention here, um, and we can just kind of fill things in as we talk about them. And could I also ask you to pass out those handouts for us? That'd be great. So we looked already. Uh, we have one here, Revelation 6, 1 to 2. And what he saw was a white horse. Okay? So uh, anybody for the second? Okay, chapter uh, chapter 6. These are all chapter 6, 3, and 4. He opened the second. What did he see? 
So we, you get that? A white horse, a red horse. How about the next one? Let's just get down to the scenes here and uh, the, the seals. Third one, where is that found? Okay, five and six, and what do you see? Black horse and rider has a pair of scales. Okay, good. Next, four seal. And what do you see? So like a gray horse or so. <laughs> what a pale horse. I don't know why we describe it that way. I, maybe an ashen color. Okay, number five, the fifth seal. Anyone, someone else? Fifth seal. Okay, starting with verse nine. And he saw our whip again. Okay, he saw some people that were killed under an altar. All right. And but that's a fifth, six, starting with verse 12, and it keeps going on. Yeah, that, that's a real long one. So there's a great earthquake and there's a terror, destruction of the natural order of things and wrong. Okay, good, good. Uh, the whole world was kind of starting to fall apart and destruction of big things. And how about the seventh seal? Chapter 8, verse 1. Yeah, well, six is so long, and the seventh is like one verse, uh, so short. Uh, so, yeah, here are, the, here are some of the scriptures up here, and we just put it there. And if Once I put it up here, it's so easily seen. What are some characteristics that we find here? Uh, one, uh, did you notice how many horses? Four. Four, okay. And uh, so they're the first four. Now, notice these are seven. Seven is a very uh, common number describing a complete and thorough uh, treatment of. And uh, so the first four and three is a pattern. The four horses mark off that pattern. As four, and of course the remaining three. And the four uh, are talking more catastrophes on earth, and we saw a couple of them. Uh, so one we saw, you see, he came out conquering, so that whole sense of war. Here, given a sword, take peace from the earth. I mean, just, we get a little feeling of that right now, right? You know, because or the whole mass immigration issue and the whole changing of countries, the whole sense of peace and what it is. Uh, here, all have to do more with food. Okay, so some things, very basic, quarter wheat for denarius, a day's wage, three quarts of barley, barley you know, a whole day just for that, you know. Uh, while some other things will not be affected, oil and wine. Uh, here, death, one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword. On your handouts, you'll find... Uh, couple extra points here. I'm not going to be discussing them much, but later on we'll, we'll look how uh, some of these scenes will repeat in future areas. That's why I'm not talking a lot, lot on it now, but it will talk about one third of the people will be killed and at the very end, everybody, the whole earth kind of uh, is, is, everybody's gone. So th there's an increase. Here we, we see it's just more of an introductory uh, understanding of what's going to be happening on earth and disasters. I don't think people take this as chronological. Um, in a minute, we're going to look at another passage as we have time, and we'll see that it's not necessarily so much chronological, but as significant, those things will be happening. And this is why the great, why this is called the Great Tribulation, because great things will, will be happening. Uh, and that the seven is more talking about the completeness of it. Uh, but as we go down and go through the book of Revelation, each of these dramas with seven scenes, We'll build on each other, and in that sense, it seems like an escalating force uh, of, of judgment being thrust on the earth. The fifth seal, uh, quite different, quite different, right? You have martyrs, people who die for their faith, just like we just heard. Are you a Christian? Yes. Boom. Uh, well, that's a martyr. I mean, in one second, good. You're in one second, you'll be in heaven. I know that's just kind of, well, okay, I wasn't planning for this. It wasn't in my uh, daily book, what I to do today, uh, but it really happened. But he talks about that. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Six seal we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, but yes, you know, with all the blood moon talk, you know, we, who, we couldn't see it from here, but you see it on the video. It really was red. It really was a blood moon, um, but no earthquakes. So I'm sorry, I disappointed you on that aspect. Uh, but that earthquake is going to be very significant. But, you know, if you trace the history of earthquakes, now we can do it on the web, that people that have actually all the earthquakes and, are, and recording them, the increased, uh, you know, thrust, and, and, and all that's recorded now, so we can actually see what's happening. Uh, and the Lamb upon the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven. We'll just briefly talk upon that. Now, I'm kind of going through things because I'm going to talk about two more in particular. 
It's Jesus that opened them. Okay? Especially in the seventh, it says, when the lamb opened the seventh seal. Each case it says he opened. The first one it says he opened. The last one it says he opened. And all the others it said he opened. So it's very apparent that he is in charge of those seals. Now here are some of the things I'm just summarizing. Went out conquering. There's a great sword. Quarter wheat for Denarius. Death and Hades. Famine. Death, in other words. Famine and pestilence. Pestilence meaning disease. Uh, being slain because of the word of God. Uh, great earthquake. Moon become blood. Harm the earth. Now these are all things we just looked at in Revelation 6 and 7 a little bit. So these are what we call signs of the end. And they call every time something like that happens. We're wondering, oh, is this the end? And by that, of course, um, the end of the world kind of really started, the last age started after the time of Jesus and just started going on. This whole era is the end because it's kind of looking forward to Christ's coming. Now, but we might add on to that. At the very end, it seems like things will even get worse and escalate more. So uh, war, random killing. I mean, does that sound like today? Famine. My brother just said, you know, uh, maize or, or corn just went up. Uh, twice in, in Malawi. We don't have any food to eat here. The famine, is, it's really hitting them hard. And a part of it's a GMO and, and the influence and the, <laughs> you got to pay more now. You know, you, you can't use your seeds from before. You know? and, and they use more water, they have less uh, corn, and it's just destroying things. It's just terrible what's happening. Ecological disasters, you know, and martyrdom, false Christ. Uh, it's, all, it's all there. Uh, so, but you know, Jesus talked about these very things, and we, we don't want to forget that what's in Revelation has been often said beforehand, but it's written in a very uh, special way. Now, if I just read some of these verses from Matthew 24, it's also repeated in Luke and Mark. Different, differently a little bit, but pretty similar. Tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end? Now, the disciples were asking Jesus. He said... Many will come in my name saying, I'm Christ. They'll mislead many. Don't you be one that's misled. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of war, but that's not the end. For nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquake. I mean, what do you sense with Russia moving into the you know, Middle East right now? And you know, just that far from Israel, you know, it's just... Syria is just right there, right on the border of, next to the border of Israel. You know, everything is, Muslim, you know, Islam is taking over the place or trying to. Famines, earthquakes, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. In other words, it's the beginning, right? The, the pains will get worse as the uh, pregnancy goes on, uh, the labor goes on, and the delivery comes. Uh, and then... You know, pains will be excruciating. Uh, then they will deliver. You. I, I, you know, my wife had eight babies. I was nearby. I was, didn't have to go through them. But uh. then they will deliver you to tribulation. You will be killed, and you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give up its light. This is a quote from the Old Testament. The stars will fall from the sky. The powers in the heaven will be shaken. Very much like the sixth seal that we saw, isn't it? You know, the whole heavens are taking shape and, and things like this. Verse 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, uh, which could refer to the rapture, okay? <laughs> Depending on what you believe about the rapture. Um, <clears throat> but there's the trumpet, there's the gathering, there's the elect. The elect meaning the God's chosen people. We're going to be taking a quick look at that right now. I just want you to connect this elect with what we're going to be looking at, it's so important in the book of chapters 6 and 7, is sealing. Not the seal of the scroll, but the actual sealing and protecting of one. Seal the bondservants of our God, chapter 7, verse 3. So uh, it's very much like the elect. They're chosen in the sense of not just chosen because of their virtue, they're chosen because God chose them, and he says, I'm going to watch over them. And if it wasn't for God's grace, no one would be endured. That's what he says. So, again, Revelation, Jesus' word, very similar. Jesus, actually, is he not the one taking the things off the scroll, the seals off the scroll? Yeah, so he said it, and he, he's sharing that here. So, two topics, and uh, we'll close our time. 144,000, okay? And let me just read a few verses. Seven, chapter 7, verse 1, And after this, 
I saw four angels. Notice the word saw, okay? Everything. So it's like you're entering a room and you're seeing all these things. And if you can just sit down and think, okay, what does that look like? Um, four angels, four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, <laughs> so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. Uh, so again, like the four creatures, let's talk about comprehensive, isn't it? Comprehensive, mass, everything's happening. But that there's no wind blowing. It's like, and you know, everyone's like, wow, what's happening here? Why? Notice verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until, and this is the point here, we've sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe, the sons of Israel. So it's very important for us to understand the sealing is a sense of protecting their faith that they will not give up. Protecting them from the evil one, that the evil one will not tempt them beyond what they can handle. It's a promise from God. Promise for you, promise for me. No matter what we face, no matter who comes through that door, God will protect us. Oh, it's 144,000. It's, it's one of these numbers. You, you know the multiples, right? You've done this in math class, right? What, what, what do we have? 12 times... 12 times 10 times 10. You know, so it, you know, it's, it's like that full comprehensive number. And that's why you know, I understand it to re refer to the church. Yeah, the whole church. Well, okay, now this is, this is one of the key points. I'm first talking about the seal. I'll get to Israel in a minute. Now, the seal refers to protection. Now, Ephesians 1.13 says this. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed... This is for believers, for the elect, which we talked about in chapter 3, uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 3. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So there's the promise, there's the sealing, the protection, the down payment. So in other words, you were guaranteed and protected. So we, we can have that sense, yeah, I never faced those situations before. But God will be with me when I do. So never worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what can come to your door. Be peaceful. Now, we still don't lock our front door most of the time, except at night. And as some of you, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't go to the bathroom without your door locked. But, um, you know, yes, there, I, there was a murder across the street. Yeah, I know that. But, you know, we, we just have peace that God will take care of us. We'll, we'll lock it as necessary. But in the old days, no one locked their doors even at night. So it was just a whole different society. But you can have peace. And that's what I'm trying to share with you here. But yes. Paul, I think you need to define what you mean by protection. Okay, go ahead. I mean, Christians were fed to the lions. You know, down in uh, Charleston, those uh, seven, eight people were killed, right? They, they weren't protected. Oh, okay. Um, so, and this is a key issue when we talk about the pre-trib rapture. Because one of their key points is going back to the Philadelphia church that the church will be protected from the tribulation. Now the problem is that, oh yeah, God, the problem with this, I don't like it because this is not what we see in Revelation. If God loves me, he will never let me be hurt. Now who did God love the most but his beloved son? And his beloved son died on the cross. He experienced so many hardships in life. So it, I don't go for that argument. I think it's a very dangerous one. And I, I, I thank you, Rich, for reminding us. Uh, but the, the seal is so much protection to go through a strengthening of the faith that we can endure whatever we face. So we don't have to worry. We can have peace. Uh, our lives are not consistent in what we have, but in what God has promised to me. I will have everything I need for whatever comes up. Now, let me go talk about this a little bit more here uh, using those charts we talked about before. Now, I heard the number of those who were sealed, and I know Victor's thought, okay, uh, these, these Jewish. Now, the reason he's talking about Jewish, because I didn't read all these verses. I don't know how you know that, Victor, but yes. 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, from Gad, from Asher, from Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Asgar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Okay, these are the, each, it lists all 12 tribes here, 
and says there's 12,000 taken from them. Let me just look at the details quickly for you. Some believe it's just for Jewish people because, for example, the pre-trib rapture, they say all the church is taken. Now God's going to be saving people like these 12,000 from each of the tribe, and they are going to be the evangelists that go out to the world. Uh, so that's what they're thinking. I'm thinking this represents actually the whole church uh, because of God's promise to uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that in that seed, you know, the seed, this is it, the promise to Jacob, Israel, the true Israel. And Israel sometimes refers to the church, the true Israel, it says in Galatians 6. It talks about the uh, true circumcision, circumcised of the heart. Uh, so in that sense, we see of uh, God's people here, the children of Jacob. Uh, but in, in terms of detail, Judah is first listed, even though he wasn't first born, but the other three lost their eldest inheritance, a special inheritance, and Judah gained that. Uh, Manasseh, secondly, point out, was actually not a son, but a grandson. He was the son of who? Joseph. Joseph, when he was over in Egypt. But Joseph got two portions. That was his blessing. Okay? And so Joseph and his son is mentioned here to make up two. Uh, the last one that we're missing, which tribe? Whoops, I just showed you Dan. Okay, Dan's missing because he was a tribe, the tribe that went off to the north and I became idolatrous. Also, and, uh, so was, that we won't take this literally. I think that's another reason. Okay, uh, so that we will not take this literally, that actually there will be 12,000 uh, from Manasseh or whatever, because we don't know there's even. There's one tribe missing. Right? And there's one, if you look at it that way, yes, there's one tribe missing. Just to finish this talk off, so here's the church that's promised its rapture. Uh, they keep us from tribulation. And so the 144,000 are Jews, um, and they would bring the gospel on, and they would spread. What I'm suggesting here instead is the bottom, is that God promised to keep us, to seal us through the tribulation. Not that we wouldn't be hurt, but we wouldn't have to bear anything that God did not want us to bear. And so this 144,000 is actually a promise that God would be with us and protect us. Now, what's so confirming of all this is the next explanation, and we'll stop there, is the martyr sandwich, I call it. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 9 to 12, we have a praise scene. Uh, and the bottom of the sandwich is the comfort scene, chapter 7, verse 15 to 17. But in the middle is the martyr's suffering. And one of the elders, verse 13, one of the elders answered saying to me, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they? From where have they come? I said to them, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 13, 14, chapter 7. So what we have here is, that's this key point. But just before that, we have the whole scene of Revelation 4 and 5 with uh, everyone praising God, uh, with countless multitude, and on the bottom, verse 15 to 17, we have a comfort scene that for the Lamb is at the center of the throne, shall be their shepherd, and shall guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear of their eyes. This goes back to the fifth, teal, fifth seal, where we saw the martyrs under the altar. And God is saying that, don't you worry. I have paid very close attention to every one of them. Through their death, I'm watching over them. And, and, and this is the whole point here. The praise scene, God's in perfect control. The comfort scene, I'm going to make sure they get rewarded for what they have coming. So I know we can feel hard for them. And, you know, all that was it uh, on the Ethiopians that were lined up on the shore? Do you remember that? <laughs> you know, state your faith, you know, coom, and off with your head. Uh, and, and a very, very vivid scene. I didn't look there, look at the video. But, um, you know, this is, this is what we're in right now. But God is there. And this last seal, where we're stopping here, Revelation 8.1. When he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about a half hour. I don't know what you think of what happened. Because when we look at Revelation 4 and 5, heaven was noisy. It, I mean, great trumpets and sounds and worship teams and people praising, and then all of a sudden, silence. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm watching over all of this. 
Nothing's going on without my care. I am seeing what's happening. Uh, and, and this is our comfort from here that, especially when he takes the most serious case, when a Christian is killed for nothing but for his testimony, that God is saying, I am even still in control of this. He, the lamb, was the one who took that seal off, that fifth seal, that, that wax. He unsealed it, didn't he? And he says, I am in control. He, we, as a church, are sharing his sufferings. And, and this is what's happening in our life right now. So God's given us special insight into these scenes to help us to go through the tribulation. Um, there's a lot of encouragements, even the most difficult circumstances. God says, I'm with you. You need not worry. Now, they're giving clue. They give us the heavenly perspective, the earthly perspective, things that are happening. Some will be far beyond anything we have. And I know you have your jobs and line, your hopes for family and house. And, uh, but, you know, who knows what's happening in this world? I would just say this as, you know, as a friend, as a pastor, just every once in a while, just say, well, all I have... Yeah, it doesn't mean that much. One day I'm just going to give it up. What I have most important is you and your love for me, that I'll be with you forever. It's that comfort, that encouragement, and that things is not what we're running after, but just at peace with the Lord. Let's close. Thank you so much for the wonderful ways you work in our life. We thank you for your blessings, for salvation, for the hope that you put in our hearts. We pray that you would particularly shield those, Lord, who recently, um, the churches there must be totally impacted there with some of their brothers and sisters being killed. Uh, we, we pray for us, Lord, as a church who feels it a little bit. Uh, we pray, God, that you would indeed help us to cherish you and what you've given us more than this world which is passing away. It's you who are will live forever. The, who gives and comfort and strengthen and there'll be no more tears. Oh, thank you so much for your promises, for your teaching, for the insights. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes Scene 2, The Suffering of the Saints from Revelation 6 to chapter 8, verse 1 by Paul Bucknell. Produced by Biblical Foundations for Freedom, www.foundationsforfreedom.net. Releasing God's truth to a new generation.